we live in a world which is less and less dominated by the West. The idea of the West is progressively dying. If we're talking about universal agreements, like we all universally, every single company must agree on these ESG principles and forge a strong path ahead. Well, boy, I feel like now in this conversation, we're demonstrating just how difficult it is for three people to even agree on the fact of what happened. Of course happened. it is, of course. Oh, it's this even, is what makes well, our conversation interesting. When you talk about collaboration between governments and businesses, these are not equal partners because one of them has the monopoly on the legitimate use of force behind them. This is why you have laws. The things that you're identifying as responsible for that divergence around 2008, I mean, I'm sorry, it just validates the libertarian hypothesis, doesn't it? I don't think so. No, no, no. I think there are many other reasons. This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. What's the agenda of the World Economic Forum? And what was the Great Reset? Just asking questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, Reason Senior Producer, joined by my co-host Liz Wolf, Reason Associate Editor and author of the Reason Roundup, which you can get in your inbox every morning if you just subscribe. Hi, Liz. Hey, Zach. Every year, there's a big gathering of global elites in Davos, world leaders, titans of industry, Hollywood celebrities. It all started in 1971, thanks to this man, Klaus Schwab, a German economist and business professor who launched what was then called the European Economic Forum as a place to discuss best business practices and promote a theory he developed called stakeholder capitalism, the tenets of which Schwab laid out in the original Davos Manifesto which insists that a company's CEO must serve not only shareholders, but entire societies, and assume the role of a trustee of the material universe for future generations. While critics have for years lampooned Davos for its brigade of private jets dropping billionaires in an idyllic Swiss mountain town to lecture us about climate change, the WEF and Schwab himself attracted unprecedented attention amidst the lockdowns of the COVID-19 pandemic following the July 2020 publication of his somewhat ominously titled book, The Great Reset. Countless articles, podcasts, and videos theorized on the real meaning of The Great Reset, including one produced by me, which we'll link in the description. But you might notice there's another name underneath Schwab's. Thierry Malloray was his co-author on The Great Reset, and the follow-up, The Great Narrative, and he joins us on the show today. Mallory is an economist who's worked as an advisor for major investment banks and governments. He conceived of and planned the program at Davos several years before parting ways with Klaus Schwab, and he's also an author, most recently, of a very interesting book we're going to discuss at length today called Deaths at Davos which I would characterize as a dark satire of what's going on within the WEF. Barry Mallory, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. There are so many interesting aspects of this book, uh, starting with the foreword. Let's bring that up, John. Um, it disclaims that this is a work of fiction. I'd say a quite thinly veiled one, if we're being honest, and then characterizes it as an overture in a series of collaborative novels where you're inviting others to jump in and expand on what you've started here. What is your objective with the project? My objective is to write a book, an interesting thriller. It's a and um, thrillers are wonderful tools because when you write a thriller or a novel, you're only bound by the power of your own imagination. Good. Hence this idea to write a thriller um, in an ideal setting, because um, it takes place at Davos. It's not a World Economic Forum Davos, though. It has a different title, a different setting, which is called a circle. And the idea is to capitalize on this um, principle of Greek tragedy, three principles of unity of action, unity of time, and unity of place. Therefore, it's an ideal setting to expand on the idea of a series of murders and it's traditional who done it, what's happening no, and no. why. What did Klaus Schwab think of this book and what's your current relationship with him like? I didn't ask him what he thought of it and um, it's a question you should 
ask Klaus Schwab. I don't know whether he wrote, probably he might have read the book, but it could also be that he didn't read the book. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's, um, so yeah, it's all contained in the circle, uh, which yep. looks a lot like Davos. Uh, this series of murders happens. Yeah. Everyone is kind of locked down in Davos uh, for an extended period of time as they mm -hmm. figure out what is going on. Um, I won't give any spoilers as to how this ultimately resolves, but um, to return to the forward for a second, it, it does seem that you're inviting others to jump in here and continue the story. Um, what's that all about? But again, it's a thriller, and we are all uh, possessed with this idea that we'd like to know what's happening. Who, who does uh -huh. it? Who did it? So who done it? And the principle of a collaboration with others which already took place for the first um, book, uh -huh. the sequels, is that you expand the power of your own imagination. You associate others to co-write a book with you, and it just makes it richer, more interesting, more dense, with more ideas. The book um, strongly implies that, and correct me if I'm wrong in this reading, that the WEF, which is uh, as of a 2023-2024 annual report, took in about $320 million in U.S. dollars in revenue, might actually be in a fairly precarious situation after its leader departs. In the book, the leader is named the Don, in mm -hmm. reality, the leader of the WF and the founder, as we mentioned, is Klaus Schwab. Um, the The book even references an article that, if you Google the headline, actually exists in real life. I'm going to bring that to the stage for a second. Mutant, it's in The Guardian. Mutiny erupts among WF staff over role of Mr. Davos. And there's, there's uh, Mr. Schwab. Um, and it reads that... Uh, Employees have voiced strong criticism of their chair and the lack of a succession strategy. The And it describes uh, insiders are telling The Guardian that the 82-year-old Schwab was law unto him, a law unto himself um, and is completely unaccountable to anyone inside or outside of the organization. What's, as someone who's worked uh, alongside Schwab before and seen the inner workings. Um, but what do you think is in store for the future of the WEF? Uh, I, I'm not sure. And again, the book is not about the WEF. And the, the WEF is, um, could be uh, another institution. There are many, many prominent gatherings around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I want to emphasize that uh, it's not about the WEF, it's about the circle. I left the World Economic Forum um, more than 17 years ago, so a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I stayed in touch with Klaus Schwab because I co-wrote two books with him, but I'm not particularly interested in what's happening at the World Economic Forum. I attend, again, many gatherings all around the world. The WEF could be the Wilken Institute. It could be, you know, the, the zillions of very prominent organizations that organize important gatherings around the world. Mm -hmm. So if you want a response regarding your question about the WEF, you should ask the WEF itself. Um, I'm not sure, but there are many people immensely qualified at the WEF at the forum to respond mm -hmm. to your question about the future of the, of, the, of the organization. And I'm sure that many journalists ask that question every year to, to the World Economic uh, do, Forum. I mean, do, do you believe that it remains an important organization? It seems to attract world leaders, very uh, wealthy and influential people still show up year after year. And it does, the Dav the annual Davos conference seems to drive uh, a conversation every year. Like, how do you think about what the, the WEF actually is right now? Well, many conversations, you know, there's zillions of conversations taking place every year at the World Economic Forum. Not only in Davos, by the way, but many other places yeah. because there are other WEF events organized around the world. Um, so yes, it is a, success, it's a very successful organization. It's a very successful business, uh, which was mm -hmm. set up by Klaus Schwab, as you just reminded in your presentation about uh, uh, 50 years ago in 71, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah. And yeah, what has been achieved is amazing. But again, it's a gathering. It's a platform to um, invite people who uh, then engage in multiple um, mm -hmm. different multi-layered conversations. Oh, and who we'll come to the business as well. Yeah, I guess what I'm what I'm getting at here is that I do detect a critique of, if not the WF itself, at least organizations of its kind. I just want to pull up a little passage from your book here. Yep. Uh, let's add that to the stage. Um, we're talking here about the Don, uh, who is a, let's say, Klaus Schwab-like figure. Uh, who heads up this organization, the circle, um, and things are kind of falling apart at this moment as the the murders stack up, as the bodies stack up, mm -hmm. and the media coverage turns extremely negative, and he, he kind of is feeling himself losing control over the narrative. And what you write here are, the words about the circle sounded like a death knell for his illusions, his mm -hmm. most painful moment, the unraveling of his opus. He had appointed himself admirable of a fleet that was sailing away without him before his very eyes toward a new world disorder where power would belong to a violent cabal of disparate countries bound to one another only by their common hatred for the remnants of the Western world order to which he had devoted his life. This world had come to a brutal end. Um, sounds a little bit to me, like we're talking about the end of the dream that the WF was founded on of this interconnected globalist society and the rise of uh, the kind of reemergence of nationalism, the end of the end of history, if we want to put it that way. Um, is that your, like, what, what is your reading of like, the where um is the vision of the wef dying ultimately well again i want to emphasize once again that this is not about the wef however the wef is a western organization undoubtedly you know it's based in switzerland and like many very prominent platforms or event organized of organizations it's a western organization and uh, the thought uh, extract to, yeah, that you just read points to the fact that we live in a world which is less and less dominated by the West. The idea of the West is progressively dying. Um, we, uh, you know, the West, the Western world, the US, Europe, and a few other countries represents probably 12, 13, 14% of the world population. And in this short extract, I just wanted to use the fact that. We have to be aware of this uh, critical transition from a Western-dominated world to a world that is going to be multipolar and in which there'll be many centers of power and uh, influence. You know, China, of course, uh, the global south, uh, many small regional centers, influential regional centers emerging, India, Brazil, South Africa. And that's a reality, and we have to be aware of it, even if you don't like it, even if we don't like it to the West, because it signals the end of the world as we knew it. What, um, what's something that's always been at the center of the WF's agenda, as I laid out in the beginning there, is um, this notion of stakeholder capitalism, where mm -hmm. um, you've got a sort of expansion of what, how capitalism is supposed to function. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we've got a clip here of uh, Klaus Schwab talking about stakeholder capitalism okay. in the context of uh, in the context of the pandemic. So shortly after the pandemic, he gave an interview on that topic, which I think is central to the Great Reset, which you co-authored also. So let's uh, play that clip and talk a little mm -hmm. bit about stakeholder capitalism. Mm -hmm. The COVID crisis has shown us that companies which uh, were committed uh, to the stakeholder concept have performed much better because they have invested into the long-term vitality of the company. So um, 
What we have to do now and what is very uh, important is to walk the talk. And walking the talk means not just to talk about stakeholder capitalism, but also to establish a framework of metrics uh, which allow everybody to see that the company is performing according to the ESG criteria. Okay, so there was, I would, what I would, the way I see it, ESG, which is sort of a component, ESG investing, which is a sort of component of stakeholder capitalism, where investors are taking into account not only, you know, quarterly returns or whatever, they're also thinking about mm -hmm. what are their environmental, social, and governance impacts and how are those going to affect their future business. Um, that really hit a zenith. This is um, uh, a from uh, fact set, which uh, has tracked how often ESG has been cited in earnings calls. Um, mm -hmm. It shows kind of a peak there around 2021 and then a slow decline in 2022. Um, another way to look at it is this group, the Principles for Responsible Investment, uh, has a, you can sign on and say like, we're, we're kind of committed to these principles and you can see a, a fairly large, uh, steady increase through 2018 and then a real uh, kind of in uh, acceleration uh, of the growth trend there. And then now we're, we're starting to see a little bit of a flattening off. Um, what is your like overall view of ESG, of stakeholder capitalism? Has it been effective? Has it delivered on its promise? Okay. Well, the idea of um, stakeholder capitalism um, has been formulated in opposition to the idea of to the concept of shareholder capitalism, of course. Yeah. Um, espoused by, by Milton Friedman. Um, in, in the book, The Great Reset, we, we espouse the notion of stakeholder capitalism because, in our opinion, both, you know, my course and myself, uh, it, the notion of ESG um, takes into account the externalities that happened across the economy. You know, there are many negative externalities associated with some economic activities. Um, the best known externalities, negative externalities are pollution, climate change. Uh, and therefore, we we embrace this idea that um, if you want to act in the most responsible possible manner, uh, ESG, but ESG is hard to define, but responsible capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, is probably a more sound principle because it takes into account the problems of society at large. Um, ESG, as you just pointed out with this graph, um, has encountered many difficulties. The, the primary difficulty is that it's very, very hard to define. And there are many problems associated with the metrics of ESG. Um, the notion is relatively new. It's, uh, it goes back on your graph to uh, 2018, 2019. That's when companies started to talk about ESG principles. And it's going to take much, much longer before we come up with a system of metrics that is sufficient for companies to take them into account in a proper, visible, understandable manner that can be utilized into financial markets, which is not the case yet. And I think that explains partly the reason why ESG has been under so much criticism recently, because everybody's aware that uh, until now you don't have a single metric that allow you to measure the impact you have on the environment and society, uh, which are the two critical components of uh, ESG governance is separate. I mean, hasn't it also become a little bit of a form of virtue signaling, right? Companies aren't going to do things that are opposed to their self-interest and opposed to serving their shareholders. And so ultimately it becomes a means, just like many other things, just like many other diversity initiatives or environmental initiatives, mm -hmm. it becomes a means of branding, but not uh, actually. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. Not only is I couldn't agree more with you, many companies use it that way. You know, hence the idea of uh, uh, greenwashing and what uh, was wrong signaling, with... et cetera. But yeah. uh, this said, there are many companies that mean it. You know, some don't, others do. Um, 
And again, it won't be possible to tell with precision which are the principles of ESG, the proper you know, criteria that determine whether a company abides by ESG principles until you have metrics that are beyond reproach and universally agreed by everybody in the financial markets, which is not the case yet. What was wrong with the sort of Milton Friedman way of looking at it, of you know, good old-fashioned shareholder capitalism? Well, what's wrong, again, is this idea of negative, negative externalities that are not being taken into account uh, by many, copper, many companies. Uh, you know, you do good, you do good for your shareholders, but if you do badly for the future generations, which is again the case with climate change, you know, unless you deny the veracity of what's happening with the climate and the environment and biodiversity degradation, uh, you leave the future generations with a planet that is hardly habitable. Uh, that's what characterizes a negative externality. You know, you produce negative outcomes that go beyond the responsibility of the company itself and that are being bought by society at large. So that's what's wrong in some cases with shareholder capitalism. By So by using this mechanism of you know, an ESG metric, which you're saying is imperfect at this point, and that's perhaps why very much so. Yeah, companies are shying away from it because there's no real standard. I mean, mm -hmm. is there? Is it possible that that's impossible to set some sort of universal standard that companies are all going to abide by? I mean, there's also the question of like how voluntary is this, or should this be? Because Right now, it it you know it's it's somewhat voluntary. You know they're they're adopting this. On the other hand, here in the U.S., the SEC has set you know ESG standards in recent years, and so that's in a way codifying it into law. And the Biden administration has uh, you know required the companies report their uh, sort of what they are doing, if anything, to comply with these standards. And that adds a certain expense to the bottom line. Um, what I saw was, you know, in the, in the millions of dollars annually. So doesn't look so voluntary, right? Like, yeah, it, 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 is it voluntary? And it, is it really possible to have that sort of standard? <laughs> well, of course it is possible. It is possible, but it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort and a lot of um uh, agreements, uh, because the system uh -huh. has to be universally recognized, otherwise it doesn't operate. No. Uh, mm -hmm. You have accounting principles, and it took ages to put them into place and to be universally agreed. And now financial markets operate efficiently because they use pretty much the same accounting principles. But you could also account for negative externalities, which I just mentioned, you know, the primary yeah. of which is climate climate change. Are Chinese it's, like, it's, it's, adopting ESG standards? It seems like, I mean, when we look at where pollution comes from, I mean, China is a massive economic force where seemingly we have to get a bunch of Chinese corporations to agree to ESG standards. How's that going? It's not going very well for the moment, okay. for sure. That's, that's going to be a big problem, right? <laughs> that's what I said at the beginning. Of course, it's going to be a big problem. It's very, yeah. very hard to, to come up with an agreement that is is it a fool's accepted. errand though, right? Like, is this just... Sorry? Like, is it is it a fool's errand? Is this just wishful thinking? This doesn't strike me as very realistic. Well, I I don't think it's wishful thinking because the size of the problem is immense. I I think we can all agree that the problem posed by climate change are considerable. So, you know, ESG, you can leave aside governance, society for the moment, DEI, etc. But... You know, the E is absolutely essential because otherwise, as I said, we leave this planet un uninhabitable for future well, generations. But that's not the so thing that we, we're we need to agree, right? Hmm? Like, that's not Sorry? the part of it. We're not disputing the underlying goal of that mm -hmm. being important. The thing that we're disputing is whether or not this system of sort of like um, cuddly, you know, mm -hmm. feel good capitalism. Uh, all the Chinese companies and all the Western companies agree to ESG principles, and they're universally enacted capitalism that seems unlikely to actually be the thing that curbs the environmental yeah. damage that we're all worried about. So that's the thing that I'm skeptical of. Yeah. 
It's a good point. It's a good yeah, point. Well, you can... what do you... Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no. Uh, you know, if you can start already with a principle that is agreed both in the US and in Europe, it would be a very good start. And it's not even the case yet. So but... know, let's start step by step. Um, Europe is progressing uh, quite fast, but not fast enough. Uh, different countries are progressing different paces. Uh, and uh, I think everybody agree that we need to agree universally about the principle. It's going to take time. It's going to be very difficult, as you just said. But the size of the challenge is also monumental. So we hopefully will come to an agreement as we realize that there is no choice but to agree on a certain principle. But how how do you reply to Milton Friedman's original objections to this? You know, you, you mentioned that this was directly formed as a sort of rebuttal to Milton Friedman's defense of share, classic shareholder capitalism, which he published in this 1971 article yep. in the New York Times, mm -hmm. where he argued that uh, the businessmen that believe they're defending free enterprise when they declaim that business is not concerned merely with profit, but also with promoting desirable social ends, that a business has a social conscious, are in fact, if anyone took them seriously, preaching pure and un unadulterated socialism. Businessmen who talk this way are unwitting puppets of the intellectual forces that have been undermining the basis of a free society these past decades. So what, what I read there is Friedman is saying, essentially, you're just laying the groundwork for socialism um, it, because you're compromising really what capitalism is essentially about, which is providing a return for mm -hmm. investors. Sure. And that was a credo. That was the assertion that Friedman made in 71. Yeah. And I think that many people would now dispute this uh, assertion and its uh, validity. I know this is very much at the core of what libertarianism is all about, you know, this yes. uh, very fundamental value of uh, shareholder capitalism. Uh, but I could invite you to visit many companies in Europe where I reside, where you have companies that are incredibly successful from a shareholder's point of view, and also companies that are adopting the, embracing the principle of shareholder capitalism. You know, you can do both. There is no tension. There is no opposition fundamentally between making money for the shareholders and making money for your employees, for the community. But your, I, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. You can do both. You can, it's a false antinomy to think that it's either one or the other. But and can you? Because second, if, you if you compare European countries and sort of the European level of innovation to the level of value created in the United States, mm -hmm. it's not even it's not even close. But, so. Is compromising well, it, on yeah. things like, uh, like, is, is it really, are you really going to achieve the same level of growth if you're, you know, have all these other uh, uh, secondary, yeah. uh, if these sort of secondary concerns move into the driver's seat and become primary concerns? Well, uh, two, two, two remarks about that. Uh, first of all, it's not even close, but it's not even close since 2008. So yeah. it's a very short uh, moment in time. Uh, and it's true that at the moment there is a fundamental phenomenal divergence between GDP growth in the US and GDP growth in Europe. Um, however, I could give you many, many examples of companies that are incredibly successful. Um, in Denmark, for example, uh, Novo Nordisk, you know, uh, innov very innovative and companies that quintessentially embrace the principle of stakeholder capitalism. So again, this idea that one excludes the other is wrong. You can be very, very profitable for your shareholders. But what, and you what can do you be think? Very, yep. What do you and think? You be, what do you think uh, explains that divergence? Then, if it's not sort of either the regulatory environment of Europe or this emphasis on other things besides returning shareholder value, like what, why? Why, why did yeah. why, why did the U.S. and Europe diverge yeah. after two thousand eight so dramatically? It's a question that is being looked at by many, many economists with different responses at the moment. Um, one surprisingly is immigration. You know, the size of the, of, the, of the labor market. It's true that the US, uh, at the end of the day, GDP growth depends on two things, which is the labor force, the size of the labor force, and productivity. So at the moment, the US is in 
fortunate position of having an expanding labor force because of immigration, thanks to immigration, and higher productivity than in Europe. And it's true that it's very much driven by the ability of the US economy to innovate um, more than Europe or more than any other region of the world. Um, but it's just uh, like an, a, an ideology the, of drastically increasing immigration, drastically uh, cutting regulation, and you know, really focusing on shareholder capitalism, aka libertarianism, sure delivers a pretty astonishing amount of technological growth, right? Like the things that you're identifying as responsible for that divergence Absolutely. around 2008 are all things that, I mean, I'm sorry, it just validates the libertarian hypothesis, doesn't it? I don't think so. No, no, no. no. I think there are many other reasons. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, the notion of libertarianism has to be, I think, much more nuanced than what you say. Not all companies in the US is part of the principle of stakeholder capitalism or shareholder capitalism. It's a continuum with many, many variations right. in them. Isn't but it? But I'm talking about the the yes. labor market, like the the I'm talking about the conditions within which businesses are operating. I'm not talking about every single business personally adhering to those principles, right? Well, take a counter example which is incredibly effective and telling. The most free country today, economically in the world, what is it? Is it the US? No, it's not. According to the oh, Institute, Singapore, something like that. Switzerland, yeah. Switzerland, Switzerland. Okay. Switzerland. Well, I worked in Switzerland for many, many years. I live five kilometers away from Switzerland. Switzerland <laughs> is a fantastic example of a country that combines the two principles of shareholder capitalism and stakeholder capitalism. It's an incredibly innovative economy that combines both. You know, you go to Switzerland, every company feels responsible for its employees, for the community, does a lot for uh, the region in which it's embedded. So again, you know, it's you, you, you need a much more nuanced approach. You can be espousing the principle of shareholder and stakeholder capitalism at the same time. And Switzerland is a good example of that. It's an incredibly innovative think- economy oh. with a very strong social safety net. Uh, and it doesn't prevent Switzerland to grow in, in terms of capability to grow. To... It's one of the most effective economies in the world. Who? Hmm. Zach, did you want to go? Oh, yeah. Well, I, well I, I had one more question about stakeholder capitalism, and then I want to yeah. move on to uh, sure. talking a little bit more about uh, libertarians, because um, uh, Klaus Schwab in particular has had some choice words for libertarians. But mm-hmm. on the stakeholder capitalism uh, point. The thing that my central concern with it, um, and this is articulated in the video that I made about your book, uh, The Great Reset, which again, we'll link in, in the comments here, mm-hmm. is that um, sort of taking Milton Friedman's assertion seriously that it could sow the seeds of something a little more dangerous. If you're talking about, for instance, stakeholders being represented on corporate boards uh, instead of just shareholders, which is a, an idea that's been floated here in the U.S. as well by mm-hmm. people like Senator Elizabeth Warren, and I think has taken its most sort of extreme manifestation in China, where they literally have a member of the CCP, of the Chinese Communist mm-hmm. Party, on the corporate board of all their largest companies. And mm-hmm. that, in a way, seems to me like the ultimate realization of stakeholder capitalism and now you're suddenly into this, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, socialism or corporatism, uh, this meld, fascism, this melding of public mm-hmm. and private in a really unseemly way. Whereas the sort of classical way to deal with externalities like pollution would be to just say, look, the gov- that's the role of the government. If you're polluting, you're going to have to pay for the pollution. We're not going to do it by sort of reshaping the mission of your capitalist mm-hmm. organization with mm-hmm. by putting a member of our government on your board. Um, should I be, should, am I being too alarmist to worry about stakeholder capitalism leading to that sort of corporatist outcome? Well, Zach, I don't think you're too alarmist, but again, I want to point out that we are dealing with a continuum. Uh, no, uh, with many, many variations and many nuances. So there is an infinity of possibilities between the model you described, which is 
the possible case in the US of a company which only adheres to shareholder capitalism, even though I doubt that there are many such companies in the US. And then the extreme case at the other end of the spectrum of Chinese companies in which you are the member of the party monitoring what's happening with the company. But again, as I said, you can have some companies and economies which are incredibly successful, incredibly innovative, which are in between. No, in between these two ends of the spectrum. Again, you, you take Switzerland, you take Denmark, you take Sweden, in which you have incredibly innovative companies. You know, Switzerland is probably the most innovative country in the world and has been defined as such by many, many rankings, by many different organizations in the US and elsewhere. And in Switzerland, you have a member of the workforce that sits on the board of the company. That's a rule. It's part of the culture of uh, doing business in Switzerland. And there is nothing wrong with that. It doesn't prevent the companies to innovate or to be ensconced in some kind of socialism, as you describe it. So mm -hmm. you know, culture, history plays a very definite role in the way in which a system of governance is being set up and is not you know, caring about your employees, not an impediment to innovation, and is not going to be the company less successful, quite the opposite, in fact. Well, it's funny to me that we're talking about Switzerland as this like incredible hotbed of innovation where tons and tons of companies um, are seated there when I can't think of a single software tool or hardware tool or medical innovation. I can't really think of anything that I have around my home or that I use in my life that was born in Switzerland. Am I missing something? Swiss Army Knife. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess Swiss Army Knife. That's a really good point, Zach. But you know, even Finland can point to like Spotify or whatever, right? Like, what 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 comes out of Switzerland? Legitimate, a legitimate no, question. Because I don't finance, know. Finance, right? No. Zillions of things. Yep. You know, we can. Yeah. You take Roche, the the the, the pharma company, for example, uh, which is a Swiss company. It's a small country. It's a country with uh, six million people. It's a small yeah. economy. So probably, being American, you don't need to buy Swiss products uh, all the time. If yeah. you live in in. Uh, if you live in Europe, you buy products from Switzerland all the time in terms of engineering, manufacturing, uh, medicine, biotech. Uh, okay, but you're giving me categories that different... exist. You're not giving me actual companies, right? You just no, need... I, no, I gave you that. I gave you Roche. Roche, okay. Roche, one of the most important pharma companies in the world. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Let me ask you about... Um, so, yeah, I feel that your co-author... Uh, on the Great Reset, Klaus Schwab has sort of set up libertarians as one of the foes or something of what he's trying to achieve. Um, there was this interesting clip that uh, was circulating from the World Government Summit in 2017. I'd like to play that and sort of get your reaction or... Mm -hmm if you agree your sort of explanation of the argument that he's making yeah. here. Uh, John, could you yeah. roll that? We are at historical crossroads. We face a backlash of millions of people, particularly in the West, who feels that globalization is not working. Fixing the present system is not enough. Now there is, of course, a anti-system which is called libertarianism which means to tear down everything which creates some kind of influence of government into private lives it's demantling the system and we see certain elements of this now in the new u.s administration if we want to go forward, we need a completely new thinking. We have to integrate into our future policy making is the notion of multi-stakeholder concept. Okay. The big challenges which we have cannot be solved by governments alone, but they cannot be solved by business or civil society alone. We need new ways of cooperation, of very flexible cooperation. I wish you a very good World Government Summit. Thank you. Okay. Um, what do you think about the notion that there's this anti-system 
threat to civilization. Do you agree with what he's laying out there? I um, I never saw this video before, and uh, again, I don't want to comment on what Klaus Schwab said. However, I want to emphasize that there is a notion um, that I totally embrace, and it's at the core of the great reset that we uh, wrote together. It's this idea that the problem that the world is facing today are of such magnitude that the world is so interconnected, so interdependent, a world in which global risks conflate with each other all the time, that it's totally illusory to believe that it's only going to be one group that addresses the problems of the world. It cannot be business alone, it cannot be government alone, it cannot be civil society alone. You need to collaborate. You know, all these uh, organizations, institutions need to collaborate with each other. And the idea that only one has a valid purpose to the exclusion of everything else, I think is profoundly wrong. You know, this idea that government is evil is absurd, in my opinion. Business is absolutely fundamental because business generates value, wealth. Uh, so if there is no business, there is nothing to redistribute. But governments have, have also an effective role to play. And uh, uh, an argument that we made in the book, uh, which is at the very core of the Great Reset, is that um, to address negative externalities, which are many at the moment, and the greatest one again is climate change, um, you need a collaboration between government and the private sector businesses. Otherwise, there is no way forward. It sounds totally obvious to me. And I don't oppose one to the other. Both have a very, very significant role to play. It just seems that if you're talking, when you talk about collaboration between governments and businesses, these are not equal partners because one of them has sort of the, you know, the monopoly on the legitimate use of force behind them and can make mm -hmm. the other one do whatever they want. Um, so is there... That's is, why is you there, have, this is why you have laws yeah. uh -huh. at the root of law. In right. democratic countries. Right. But also, well, also, yeah. Zach, also, I could argue, and I think you would agree with me, that you have uh, situations in which you have uh, a market capture. You know, the interest of um, private companies becomes so huge, so prevalent in society that it's very hard to regulate the world in the, the way in which these uh, large companies operate. You sit at the moment in the US with, with big tech. No, it's a, it's an issue. Well, uh, so I'm, either either you leave them alone that they do whatever they want, um, without any consideration for the externalities that may emerge uh, at a later stage, or you regulate the uh, behavior. And uh, thanks to God, in the U.S., in Europe, we live in countries in which the rule of law prevails, and it's the best guarantee against the extreme deviations you. That you did to be full. But I think Zach is making an even more fundamental point. And I think the comparison that you're drawing um, is completely unequal, right? Because we have large tech companies, um, which, you know, we use the derogatory term big tech uh, when we talk about them. But fundamentally, these companies are ones which provide value to millions and in some cases, billions of people, consenting users, paying customers, people who are not forced to use their product. Mm -hmm. I'm not forced to have a Twitter account, nor am I forced to have a Facebook account or to buy things on Amazon, right? I just named some of the common uh, or or to use, the, you know, the search engine Google. I'm not forced at point of gun to use any of these things. I use them because I want to, and I use them on a daily basis. And, you know, millions of people just like me all around the world do the exact same thing. But consider the opposite, which is that I live under American law. And yes, rule of law, you know, reigns different um agencies reigns law enforcement in and allows me the means of mm -hmm. disputing uh, any sort of claims in our court system. But fundamentally, the government has a monopoly on force, which allows them to create rules and regulations that I must live by at threat of going to jail if I fail to do so, or with companies at threat of paying, you know, experiencing civil or criminal consequences or having to just, you know, assent to the regulations that they foist upon you. These are fundamentally unequal things. What do you make of that? The fact that governments, you know, operate entirely because they have a monopoly on violence and they are, you know, creating rules and laws and frameworks that companies must, they, they're, they're forced to comply with. Companies are not forcing anyone to comply with, you know, 
giving them their business? Well, two two responses to your point. Well, first of all, when you say uh, the right to violence, it's uh, the right. legitimate use of physical violence, and it's extremely right. rare that governments use physical violence to regulate, or at least not in democratic countries. Uh, well, I'm not talking uh, to second, you. I'm so, saying that if I if mm, I don't live according to the way that they want and, me to, and, I will and be second, sell at a certain point, right? And second, um, you have the right to vote and to change the system. And we are blessed to be living in democratic countries in which every citizen can express his willingness to change things through vote. Mm -hmm. That's what you do in a peaceful yeah, manner. I'm, I mean, if look, you want to change I, things, you vote for different people, different preferences, yeah. different candidates. Yeah, uh, I've got I've got no problem with um, you know a public private partnership in the sense of the government needs some sort of service to be done. We're going to put out a contract for different contractors to pick up your trash or something like that. Mm -hmm. like that's a public private partnership. It's the blurring of the lines between public and private that worries me about this whole world where. Um, for instance, if you talk about big tech, wh where we mo how we most recently saw it was during the COVID pandemic, the government was basically using a backdoor to pressure the tech companies to take out down certain quote unquote misinformation and disinformation. You can mm -hmm. call that the government and the private sector working together to protect yeah. society, or you can call that the government, you know, holding a uh, threat over the heads of these tech companies to suppress information that they don't want getting out there to the people. And that's more so how I see it. And I suspect people that are at attending the Davos conference mm -hmm. see it the other way, that this is a productive way to police misinformation. Well, first of all, a comment uh, regarding what you just said about Davos. You know, there isn't a set of individuals going to Davos. In Davos, you have Americans, Chinese, yep. you had Russians, you had many, very, very many different people from all over the world with different opinions about seeing different convictions. So there isn't a set of individuals that uh, espouses the uh, cause of Davos. And in fact, uh, you Fair started enough. by you you started by putting forward this notion of uh, uh, stakeholder capitalism that uh, Klaus put forward in seventy one. <laughs> Uh, I think very few companies in Davos uh, would agree that these principles prevail in that modus operandi. You know, I think many but, CEOs in Davos are rather on your side and the side of uh, mm. um, interesting uh, stakeholder capitalism. So there is a real difference in opinions. And again, many mm. people go to Davos or to other gatherings to do business. You know, they, they are not espousing a particular set of convictions or a particular uh, ideology. Uh, I think at the end of the day, what you just said about uh, libertarianism boils down to the convictions you have about your um, political choices and uh, how you want them to be. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, libertarianism upholds the rights of individuals above all else. Am yes. I correct in defining? Um, yeah. And I think in, in Europe, we have a slightly different perspective, maybe compared to the US, because in Europe, again, Europe is not a, a single entity. There are many variations in Europe. But yep. in, in Europe, there is this uh, perception that a, a person's freedom can be another person's unfreedom. And I want to take the example which you use in the book, The Great Reset, about... Um, the mask, you know, this obligation to wear a mask. So mm -hmm. for libertarians, in many, many cases, um, the obligation to wear a mask was an infringement on the personal freedom. Am I correct? Or not? Yes. Did you see uh, it I, as I, such? Did I, you see I, it as yes, such? Yes, I, I, I saw that argument, yes. Mm -hmm. But yourself, did you believe oh, it isn't that? Did you believe it was an infringement of your personal freedom to be um, obliged uh, to wear a well, mask? Well, it's a it's a little bit complicated. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning yeah. of the pandemic, when it was there was yeah. a lot of uncertainty about how dangerous yeah. this virus was, I think you could make an argument that yeah. you know, wearing the mask was actually you know you're protecting a potent from a v potentially very dangerous thing from attacking another. So 
you're actually protecting someone else's rights yeah, by absolutely. wearing that. That's exactly what I mean. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I, think, I will say that at some point it kind of spun out and uh, there's these kind of really broad mask mandates where people could just voluntarily decide, I want to go into this space without a mask, but we've got a central entity imposing a one size fits all mandate across the board. So mm -hmm. that's where, you know, the, the sort of libertarian calculus comes in is like, at what level are these rules being set? Is it a private business saying you got to wear a mask in here, or is it a government, you know, imposing things where they really don't need to be imposed? I took it a little bit differently. I agree with what Zach is saying. I took it primarily as an infringement of my individual liberty, but an especially stupid one, because we have a lot of evidence that was even coming out at the time that, you know, indicated that the way that most people were wearing masks um, in much of the West and the types of settings that they were wearing masks in wasn't actually effective at preventing the spread in a lot of cases. Um, and so it was frustrating because it was like, this is, I am coerced into doing this. This is forced upon me for a disease that I am at very low risk of having any sort of negative problems from. And you, the government is forcing me to use a technique of quote unquote, preventing myself and other, protecting myself and That's others true. that we don't actually have very good evidence indicates is useful. And so it's there's a pointlessness at the core of it, which I think... Sure, sure, sure. But at least, I mean, the evidence came uh, exposed afterwards. You know, no, there was a lot of evidence at the time, I think, yeah. as well, that was actually mm -hmm. actively suppressed. At any time, you know, people attempted to spread it around social media, there were, yeah. again, these government censors using these backdoor channels to try to make it so a lot of this information didn't circulate because it ran contra what the public health authorities in much of the West wanted us to do. And Scandinavia, to its credit, to part of Europe's credit, to Scandinavia's credit, they really bucked the Western world trend and I think had really good results. Uh, and not, I Scandinavia, wish not Scandinavia, Sweden. Only Sweden, Sweden, yes. They lost yeah, Sweden. more up to the individual. Yeah. Um, and Sweden. it worked out fairly well for them. With not uh, great results that we examined the book. Wait, what? You know, the, the, with not such great results. How, what the, do you mean? Well, the rate of death was much higher in Sweden than it was in Finland or Norway. That's or... Not... Is that true? Yeah. Uh, well, well, absolutely. Yeah. But I, I would need you... to dig into my notes. But yeah, uh... yeah. Well, uh, anyway, I, I'm, uh, just gonna, yeah. I'm just going to recommend well, uh, yeah. um, a previous interview we did uh, on Sweden. Uh, it was with Johan Norberg, um, and we, you know, when you compare it to Europe, you know, across Europe, it had fairly low. I was on the fairly low end um, at, at the end of the day. They had Ex a you know, surge at the beginning. Mm -hmm. All that, yeah. we'll, we'll, it's, we're getting a little bit sidetracked here, but yeah, uh, yeah, we'll, absolutely. we'll, 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 we'll leave that I think the, the, We are getting sidetracked, yeah. but I think the truth of this matters. You're, you mean to tell me that Sweden had a drastically different excess mortality rate looking at the data? No, 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 not drastically. It's a bit higher, a bit higher. Okay, a, a bit yeah. higher, like to, to what magnitude, right? I mean, I look at Sweden and I look at... Yeah, I and, and again, you know, and again, this worked. And, uh, and again, you have to take into uh, account factors that are very difficult to measure, like the density of the population, the fact that uh, you know there are very few inhabitants in Sweden compared to places that was in Italy, where the rate of death was much higher. So uh, again, nuancing nuances are uh -huh. all that matter in order to make the call regarding this uh, very complex phenomenon. But I don't. I think it's oh. important to not proclaim that like Sweden's COVID approach was a failure. Like that's not my recollection of what happened, right? And I think it's important that if we're talking about universal agreements, like we all universally, every single company must agree on these ESG principles and forge a strong path ahead. Well, boy, I feel like now in this conversation, we're demonstrating just how difficult it is for three people to even agree on the fact of what of happened. Of course it is. Of course. No, it's this even. is what makes well, our conversation interesting. Well, but, uh. but so you're you're sitting here telling me that Sweden's COVID uh. handling policy was not successful. It was a failure. I'm telling you that the rate of deaths was a bit high in Sweden than it was in the rest of you. At what point That's in everything time? I'm saying. I would need okay. to look at my notes. I have no idea. I would well, need to let, check. Let's, this. let's, this bro let's four, broaden four this out a little bit to close yeah. out the conversation. Let's broaden mm -hmm. it because the Great Reset, which you co-authored with Klaus Schwab, came out uh, amidst the pandemic. And it it was a huge hit. It got a lot of attention, a lot of criticism, a lot mm -hmm. of very uh, interesting criticism and reaction. These, this is a sampling of some of the uh, very uh, interesting reactions, let's say, to the Great Reset. 
I've got a book up here by uh, Glenn Beck and Alex Jones. Um, and um, what I, well, first, let me just ask you that. What was, what was your reaction to the way that the book was received? Well, I was appalled uh, because, as you said, the book was incredibly successful, but I think it was incredibly successful for the wrong reason, because it got engulfed in this um, craziness uh, of, uh, of conspiracy theories. But, okay. um, and, uh, you know, it's very hard for me to tell how the book would have done without the conspiracy theorist uh, talking so much about it, because, of course... Probably not as well. I don't, Not as well, for sure, but yeah. it could have yeah. gone... Well, let, let me ask you about let me ask you about the conspiracy theories, though, because um, I think so. Part of the reason I think for the conspiracy theories is actually some of the messaging or packaging of the WEF been putting these ideas out. This this was just one of the ads that was circulating during yeah. COVID uh, that got a lot of chatter online. John, could you roll the WF ad? I'm going to have to read the, a little bit of this out loud because we've got audio listeners. It's eight predictions for the world in 2030. One of them is you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Another is whatever you want, you'll rent and it'll be delivered by drone. Um, so, you know, no ownership. Uh, owning things is over. You're just going to rent and oh. be happy till the yeah. end of time. Um, is that a problem for the message that you're trying to get out? Well, I mean, the, you, you're on nothing and you'd be happy. Um, it's been totally taken out of context. Um, I can't remember the precise um, circumstances, but you know, the, the web, the web economic forum. It was an essay, that, uh, it was an essay in uh, 2016 that was sort yeah, of like pulling the absolutely. Uh, sharing economy. I mean, yeah. you know, e e every year the forum uh, asks, thousand and thousand and thousand of uh, experts, academics, business leaders, etc. would they think about X, Y, and Z. And one of the persons who responded to such a survey, uh, I think in 2016 or 17, said that. But again, you know, not a web employee, not a, again, a very large diversity of opinion. So taken out of context. No, <laughs> in the case of the book, uh, the craziness was that the main big conspiracy theory said that um, the virus um, was uh, engineered by the World Economic Forum in conjunction with Bill Gates and uh, yeah. other individuals so that a vaccine could be um, developed in mm -hmm. which uh, nanoparticles would be inserted and these nanoparticles would take control of your brain so that you would lose your freedom and uh, you would become a right. slave. And, okay. That's and that's not course. that is not in the book. I can vouch for you. I've read the book. Thank you. Thank you very that. much. But I, you. I mean, I'm not, like really, what that is getting at is like I think like the sort of central conspiracy theory because I had to look into this when I was responding to your book. Yeah, is basically something along the lines of like the WF has a degrowth, depopulation agenda, and they're they want a world that is less yeah. populated. And basically, we're replaced by AIs that are going to serve all the, yeah. the few wealthy elites yeah. that remain on Earth. Um, how okay. credible is that? <laughs> I think it's totally absurd. And uh, denying a conspiracy theory is totally impossible because you mm -hmm. cannot deny the existence of something that doesn't exist. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know where it comes from, this idea that the WEF wants uh, fewer people and more technology and i mean i think i know partially where it comes from there because i was looking at the timeline of the wf's mm -hmm. creation in preparing for this and sort of the roots of the wef um in 1973 they platformed the author of this book the limits to growth which was uh, a fairly influential book in the early 70s. Of course, and, Club of Rome. You know, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. Club of Rome and kind of putting out the idea that we're going to, we're facing overpopulation. We need to do something about it. it but this is an excerpt from the book. It says, if present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production, and resource depletion continue unchanged. The limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years. So that would be 2073 by the standard. 
the most probable result will be a rather sudden and uncontrollable decline in both population and industrial capacity. It's possible to alter these growth trends and to establish a condition of ecological and economic stability that is sustainable far into the future. Just to give people a quick uh, understanding of how those predictions shook out, uh, mm -hmm. this is from Reasons Ron Bailey, who's written a lot about this. Um, he writes that they suggested in this book that in 60 years, there'd be four people in the world for everyone living today. World population stood at 3.8 billion in 1972. A fourfold increase would have yielded a total population of 15 billion by 2030. This is where we actually are. We're, you know, under 9 billion. So, you know, the project, the median projection from the UN is to crest a little over 10 billion and then flatline. And if anything, at this point, we're worried about uh, depopulation. So I, I guess like taking in that into mind, that, that it, it is kind of my central critique of these sorts of organizations. It's, it's like, should we have a little more humility about Oops. projections? Couldn't, couldn't agree more with you. Okay. Should be more this humble, is a good... And it shows the peril of making predictions. Okay. More often like than that. not, you get it wrong. That's, I think that's a so that's humility a good point. is absolutely key. I think that's a good point of agreement to end good. on because I know you've got to run. So okay. let me ask you the final question of the show, uh, which is: What is a question that you think more people should be asking? Um, what are we worrying about the most? Hmm. That the person should be asking. What because are we worried about the most? The response would determine the course of actions we we take. Oh. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one, uh, Terry Mallory. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. A privilege. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and please rate and review the show.